All right. Well, thank you, guys. Uh, our next presenting company uh, is Tanaz Energy. Uh, its ticker symbol is TNZ uh, on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Tony Marino uh, is the CEO. Tanaz Energy is a publicly traded company focused on the acquisition and sustainable development of international oil and gas assets, capable of returning free cash flow to shareholders. Tanaz has domestic operations in Canada, along with offshore gas assets in the Netherlands. The domestic operation consists of semi-conventional oil production uh, in the Rex member of the Upper Manville Group um, in central Alberta. The Netherlands gas assets are located in the Dutch sector of the North Sea. Uh, Tanaz also has an ownership interest in the, and, and I don't even know, that's, uh, in, is it the British Virgin Islands? Or BV? Uh, no, it would be uh, NGT uh, in the Netherlands uh, pipeline. And, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I'm sure he'll tell you all about it. Uh, I appreciate it. And uh, um, so with no further ado, uh, Tony Marino, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to uh, everybody for attending. It's uh, good to be back at Intercom. Uh, so first, uh, we'd ask that you note our advisory on forward-looking statements. We'll go through some background on the company. So we are a, uh, a public uh, ENP. We're TNZ on the TSX. Uh, today, I'll speak first to our current asset base, uh, our Canadian oil growth project in Alberta, and our uh, Dutch natural gas project uh, offshore. Uh, really what's most important for us is what we do going forward with our international acquire and exploit strategy, so I'll spend a bit of time uh, talking about that later. Uh, the company is debt free, in fact we have negative net debt of uh, 64 million uh, Canadian, and uh, I'll point out that in this presentation all the monetary values that are listed here are in Canadian dollars unless we otherwise note that they're USD or Euro. Uh, the company, uh, we feel, does have access to the capital markets, as demonstrated in the recap and in the previous history of the team. And uh, uh, we do think that management has a, a record of effectively being able to create value using the same strategy of international M&A and then subsequent operational improvement. So uh, what the company is going to be doing going forward is to source uh, potential acquisitions do a very careful technical evaluation of them with the objective of taking the controllable risk out of the acquisitions, uh, focusing primarily on Europe and Middle East, North Africa, although we uh, have a tertiary interest as well in the Americas. Uh, upon uh, making these transactions, we'd seek to apply our operating and technical capabilities to improve the production and cost performance. I'll talk more about that later as well. And uh, ultimately, we want to build a portfolio of assets, a diversified uh, set of assets that are capable of supporting a growth and income model uh, in the public markets. Uh, briefly on the management, uh, the team uh, has been together uh, for, uh, uh, for a lot of the elements of the team, actually for almost a 20-year period. Uh, five of the six officers that you'll see come from Vermilion Energy, and previously, uh, uh, a number of us worked at Baytex and uh, uh, Dominion prior to that. Uh, previously, I ran Vermilion and before that ran Baytex Energy. Mike Calusa, our COO, was uh, the chief operating officer also at Vermilion, running a 100,000 BOED operation in nine countries. And Brad Bedant, our CFO, uh, was treasurer and manager of financial reporting at Vermilion. Uh, on the bottom row here, we list three other officers. The one of the six officers on this list who did not come from Vermilion was Jen Russell Houston, uh, a very uh, highly qualified uh, geologist who is our, uh, explore our uh, geoscience VP. Uh, she was with OSIM uh, and uh, led the growth there. Ultimately, that company sold to Watrous. John Balkwill, who's with us in the audience today, is our VP of Corporate Development, and he had asset management and uh, BD roles at Vermilion. David Burkhart, um, our SVP of Engineering, was the CEO of the company that we recapped, uh, Altura Energy, the company we recapped to become Tenaz. Uh, previous to that, he uh, was the uh, uh, MD for the French unit of Vermilion. So again, a team that's worked together a lot and we're uh, uh, very motivated to pr pursue this common goal to create value through international acquire and exploit strategy. Uh, briefly on the board, 
Uh, Marty Proctor is our chair. Uh, Marty was uh, the CEO of Seven Gens, very successful uh, and large Canadian gas company bought by ARC. Uh, previously he had a lot of experience in the U.S. and overseas. Anna Alderson is our audit chair. She was an audit partner with KPMG in Energy and Financial Services. John Chambers um, is a continuing director who came from Altura. He was one of the founders of First Energy, very successful independent uh, dealer uh, in Calgary. And Mark Rollins is an international director. Uh, he was uh, basically co-COO of British Gas during its growth heyday, and he also was CEO of the second largest Ukrainian ENP, Ukranafta. Uh, the board is qualified in all the areas uh, uh, that are uh, going to be important to the long-term su success of the company, background in operations, background in the capital markets, and uh, very focused uh, uh, on ESG. Management of the company as well uh, has a great deal of experience in ESG and sustainability, and we're going to use it to the advantage of the company going forward. Um, so the, the history of uh, uh, Tanaz uh, is that uh, we uh, began as a public company by recapitalizing Altura Energy. So Altura Energy was a TSXV uh, company. We effected that recap in October 21. Uh, management and uh, uh, institutional and some retail investors uh, putting money in the company to uh, effect the recap and change the strategy of Altura to uh, emphasize international acquisition. Um, on the bottom left panel, we point out here that since the recap, we've been able to triple production uh, up to a, a guidance level of uh, 2,300 to 2,500 BOED for this year. Uh, counting our most recent Netherlands acquisition uh, only at uh, mid-year in terms of its production contribution. Uh, on the uh, lower right panel, we point out that cash flow or FFO will be up about tenfold since the recap, um, really driven by this uh, uh, increase in production, but also by bringing in a very high net back product, TTF natural gas, uh, into the product mix for Tanaz uh, with its high net backs. Uh, on the upper right, uh, we point out the financial position of the company. Uh, Altura had a, uh, a small amount of debt in place. We paid that off with the recap, uh, and uh, subsequently we've added to our cash balance in the company. Uh, we uh, brought in uh, about uh, uh, 47 million Canadian in our most recent transaction uh, that we made with uh, XTO in Netherlands, uh, or, or a subsidiary of ExxonMobil, bringing that cash onto the balance sheet via that transaction without any uh, equity or debt issuance, and now uh, our negative net debt level or our positive working capital is 64 million Canadian. Um, at the same time that the production's gone up, the cash flow's gone up, and the cash balance in the company has gone up, We've, reti we've retired about 4% of the shares through an NCIB. Um, the, uh, uh, this slide shows the market performance of the company, uh, traded as TNZ on the TSX, during 2023. Uh, there are, I think, 55 ENPs that trade on the TSX, ranging from the very smallest company all the way up to the largest, probably CNQ. And in that list of 55, uh, I believe we are now uh, second in TSR for 2023, one of the smaller companies is still ahead of us. Uh, with that uh, stock price change, uh, we have about a $100 million uh, market cap. There's two columns reported here to take it to EV. Uh, at the end of Q2, we had 17 million of networking capital or negative net debt uh, on the balance sheet. Uh, right after the end of the second quarter, in the early part of July, we closed that second Netherlands transaction, uh, buying XTO Netherlands from ExxonMobil, uh, brought in the additional uh, uh, cash, uh, positive networking capital onto the balance sheet. Uh, that number now standing at 64 million, uh, giving us a pro forma EV uh, at roughly today's trading price of about $38 million. So that uh, EV compares to a uh, 2P uh, NAV discounted at 10% per McDaniel's independent evaluation uh, for the uh, combination of assets, Canada and the two pieces that we bought in Netherlands, uh, totaling up to about 110 million. On top of that, we recently released our uh, contingent resource report, again evaluated independently by McDaniel, 
that indicates uh, contingently uh, were uh, uh, four fields in the Netherlands that have been discovered to be developed uh, would add a value of 86 million on a uh, NPV 10 basis. So those numbers of 110 and 86 comparing to this uh, EV of 38 million currently in the market. Uh, on the bottom of the slide, we point out that the management and the directors of TANAS are highly uh, incentivized and highly aligned to perform for the shareholders. On a basic basis, uh, through the uh, investment primarily in the recap, uh, we hold 9% of the basic shares and on a fully diluted basis, 22% of the shares of the company. And certainly we um, uh, think that this is right uh, to be in the same boat as the shareholders and uh, we do intend to deliver for the entire shareholder group. Uh, and just uh, very briefly on the 23 outlook, uh, production guidance 2300 to 2500 BOED, that counts XTO only at mid-year after closing. Uh, CapEx, uh, Canadian dollar 20 to 24 million. Uh, we didn't add any CapEx uh, uh, with the XTO deal, uh, having been running a little bit below the guidance level previously, and we'll be drilling uh, four gross 3.35 net wells in Canada this year. Product mix in the pie chart, uh, about 39% uh, out of uh, Canadian oil. Uh, another 38% from uh, Netherlands Gas, a uh, TTF marker, very high priced. I'll talk about that later. Very good contributor to uh, net back uh, cash flow and, and free cash flow. And then another 24% from ACO. Definitely a lower valued product, uh, one that we have hedged um, uh, through uh, primarily through physical contracts at uh, levels above today's uh, price. Um, so now briefly I'd like to run through both sets of assets, Canada first and then Netherlands, uh, keeping in mind that what is really important is what we put in place through this international acquire and exploit strategy for the long term, and I'll talk about that a little bit at the, uh, at the end of the presentation. So uh, the asset in Canada is a semi-conventional uh, oil development project south of Edmonton, Alberta. This is the project that Al Altura had at the time that we uh, made the recap. Um, and it's a, it's a great find by Altura. It's a shallow field, 1,300 meters deep. It's in the Manville Formation, Rex member, a sandstone. Moderately low permeability, um, I would say kind of in the single digits, uh, Milladarcy's. Uh, Altura, even though th this zone had been drilled through many times on the way to the deeper horizons at Leduc, uh, Altura recognized that it had potential for uh, development with horizontal wells and multi-stage fracks. Uh, and, uh, uh, they, they found actually what is quite a large field. I think if you include the entire mapping of the field, it can be up to a half billion barrels in place. We probably control on the order of uh, 350 or 400 million barrels of OIP, probably just about everything that is developable in the field. Um, and um, uh, we felt it was a very good uh, project that Altura had found, and it was one of the uh, uh, attractions behind using that as the recap. I mean, the uh, bigger purpose in the recap, of course, was to get the public vehicle uh, for which to uh, uh, finance and, and have valued uh, future acquisitions, but it, this is certainly a, a good asset. Um, now, in and of itself, the asset, I would say, is not large enough to carry a mid-cap company, and it starts at a pretty low level of production that we're now increasing, but it is high rate of return. It's certainly worthwhile to have in the portfolio and to invest in. We have seven-eighths of the project really in full operating control, uh, booked um, at year-end 22 at 12.5 million barrels equivalent, uh, which is only a, a few percent uh, recovery factor within that area. Uh, the 2P report has 40 gross locations. Current drilling pace, that would be uh, 10 years of inventory and probably more that could be developed outside of the uh, uh, currently recognized uh, locations. It does have a lot of infrastructure to accommodate growth, some localized expansions required, but in general, uh, most everything we would need for a, a probably a two to three X increase in production. Uh, this year's guidance uh, midpoint is 1500 BOED. Uh, that uh, uh, we increased production 20% last year and, and this year's number would represent about another 25% increase. Those uh, increases being achieved on a, a four gross 3.35 net well program uh, requiring a midpoint of 17 million Canadian in CapEx. Uh, on the way up, uh, this uh, asset can produce free cash and it's certainly gonna produce a lot when we get to the plateau level in a few years. Um, 
uh, uh, briefly, I'll describe the uh, characteristics of the wells and the, uh, what Tanaz has done with them and the economic performance. Um, so uh, Altura began developing the field with one and a quarter mile long wells. We're now up to about two and a quarter mile long wells. And of course, we do believe that this gives us better capital efficiency to get the, the longer laterals. We've made some other changes, tight, tighter frac spacing, higher conductivity, scour, uh, better geologic description to get the laterals completely within the zone and uh, achieving very nearly 100% uh, frac placement. Um, and I point out these things because uh, when I talk about the international strategy, one key point about it is that, yes, while we get assets at uh, lower multiples and higher rates of return on the base purchase overseas, uh, it's very important as well what we can do with the assets after we have them, uh, especially in an operating position. And we feel that overseas there's a much greater opportunity for operating improvement than you find in the domestic assets. Altura made a great find, they're an efficient producer, but Tanaz was uh, able to come in here and uh, significantly improve the uh, design and performance of the wells. And that's what we seek to do overseas, and uh, I think uh, in a place that has much more opportunity uh, to, to make that kind of improvement as compared to North America. Um, these two and a quarter mile long wells, as you can see on the production plot, uh, generate 250 to 300 BOED at the peak at 4.35 million Canadian per well DSET uh, capex. That generates around a 20,000 uh, uh, per day barrel uh, capital efficiency. It's about a, an $11 F&D. Uh, we had a 2.9x organic recycle at the last reserve report. Uh, so it's very efficient in terms of capital, uh, high rate of return on an ATAX basis, and a payout a little bit over one year. So good economics and uh, uh, the, uh, an example of the type of thing that we would do with operating, uh, we would intend to do with operating control in uh, overseas assets as well. Uh, and also uh, uh, in the semi-conventional development, uh, which we think of as using horizontal wells in a uh, clastic, in a low perm clastic, but not in an ultra tight rock, it's also something that we see as having uh, upside in a lot of the international basins uh, that don't have this kind of horizontal development, although it's very common in North America. So that is the uh, Canadian project. Uh, again, not the main reason for the company, but a good piece of the portfolio. Uh, next, I'll turn to the European assets, uh, offshore Netherlands. Uh, we've made two transactions over the past seven months to uh, create this non-op position in this uh, very high margin TTF gas. These are all in the shallow water uh, uh, close to uh, shore. They're in the Rotligan sandstone, conventional, moderate permeability rock, uh, very predictable. Uh, the uh, reserve totals, if you put the two deals together, roughly two million barrels equivalent, um, and uh, a run rate of about 1,250 BOED uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the second quarter. Uh, certainly a, a real positive defining characteristic of uh, this region is this TTF uh, index gas. Very high priced, uh, the balance of the year on the strip is 14 US uh, per M. Uh, next year's strip is about 17 US per M. Um, it's a volatile product, uh, but, but probably one that's gonna have uh, good pricing for some time. There's still risks in, have in uh, the sources that have uh, been used to replace the historic Russian gas. There's still Russian supply into Europe that I think is uh, 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 you know, not uh, guaranteed to continue. So uh, probably will be a high value, uh, high value product, and it's certainly one that contributes a lot of net back and, and free cash for uh, Tanaz. Uh, in addition to the upstream, I'll discuss it later, we have a, a significant interest in a midstream uh, gathering system that gathers this gas and uh, gas for uh, other operators in the area. And there is an option on a, uh, a potential CCS project as well in some of the depleted fields. Uh, having acquired just XTO for uh, accounting purposes at mid-year, guidance is 850 to 950 BOED uh, for this uh, set of assets uh, with uh, low capex, four to six million Canadian for the year. The next two slides address the undeveloped upstream potential. I'll just uh, spend a second on this one. There's a number of, uh, there's uh, four actually, uh, uh, discovered, tested, undeveloped fields. Two of them are oil fields uh, in the northern part of our uh, asset block uh, that are operated by Wintersol, the Vermeer and Rembrandt oil discoveries. 
Uh, the estimated production from these, uh, if and when developed, would be 20,000 oil a day out of the chalk. Uh, and uh, we have a 5% interest there, so that would be 1,000 net to Tanaz, pretty significant compared to the existing uh, production for the company. And there are two uh, undeveloped gas fields that have been discovered in the Neptune-operated acreage in the southern end um, uh, that um, uh, have economic promise as well. We haven't attributed any reserves to these fields. We did uh, uh, contract for a contingent report by uh, McDaniel, contingent and prospective report, to cover all the undeveloped uh, asset base. These four fields that I talked about, two oil, two gas, went into contingent resource. Uh, the mean estimate for recoverable reserves net to our interest is 4.5 million BOE, again, combination of oil and gas. Um, Again, that compares to about 14.5 million barrels equivalent for the company 2P reserves today. Uh, and uh, we had an economic case uh, created for the uh, best estimate or the midpoint uh, on these four fields with a value of 86 million uh, NPV 10 ATAC. So again, pretty significant in comparison uh, to our uh, company EV. In addition, there are 21 uh, uh, exploration prospects classified as prospective resource, not uh, fields that haven't been drilled, fields that haven't been discovered. Uh, majority of these are gas, and the uh, mean estimate uh, on a risk basis, if drilled, would be another 10 million barrels equivalent. So uh, we feel a lot of undeveloped potential in the upstream that we acquired. Uh, in the midstream, we have a 21% interest in the NGT uh, pipeline, uh, offshore pipeline system, and onshore uh, processing uh, facilities. This system is a very high reliability uh, set of assets. Uh, it's had 99.83% uptime uh, since 91. It covers about a third of the Dutch offshore serving the northern area. There's a, a number of uh, undeveloped fields in here, not only ours, but other operators that can contribute to this system for the longer term. Uh, it has a role in the uh, energy transition for Netherlands, being certified to transport green hydrogen from the kind of the very far uh, distal uh, wind uh, fields that are expected to be developed. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, it has a pretty significant dividend stream, um, 27 Canadian, uh, million Canadian a year. To all the shareholders, we have 21% of that, five and a half or $6 million a year of dividends. Uh, that have uh, uh, been applied at a very consistent basis. So a very desirable asset for us to have serving our assets and the, those of other operators. There is an option value uh, on uh, CCS. Uh, the, these uh, fields and some depleted gas fields that already exist um, have the, uh, have a, are, are situated very favorably compared to some of the major emitters in the Netherlands and in Belgium. And uh, the operator of the gas fields, Neptune Energy, is currently evaluating the potential for a CCS project. Um, it's thought that the main stores here could uh, be as high as 120 or 150 million, uh, 150 uh, megatons of CO2, uh, and uh, uh, injecting at a rate of probably around five megatons per year. Uh, there is a high carbon price in Europe, 85 euros a ton. There are incentives for emitters to commit to this kind of project. Uh, if uh, the project proceeds and if we participate in it, uh, we would have an 11.35% interest. Uh, that would be enough uh, carbon offset to cover Tanaz up to a production level of about 50,000 BOED, or roughly uh, 20 times our current level uh, while maintaining carbon neutrality. Again, uh, it, it, uh, there's no certainty that it will uh, have an investment here, but uh, it is another uh, potential source of value out of the Netherlands assets. So with that discussion of the existing assets, I want to spend just a couple of minutes to uh, discuss the overall strategy for international acquisitions. Um, the first thing on this slide uh, to note is the map. So we colored in all the jurisdictions, both in dark blue and light blue, where the team has experience. And uh, we shaded in the dark blue the jurisdictions that we think at least initially are worthy of consideration for investment. Um, our main geographic area of emphasis is Europe. The second most important to us is MENA or Middle East, North Africa. And then we have a tertiary uh, interest in uh, Americas, including potentially optionality for Canada, 
uh, no intention at this point of attempting to compete in the U.S., although the team does have experience there previously. Uh, we know it's a wide funnel. We think that's a good thing. allows us to select the best projects in attempting to uh, uh, find deals and find value for the shareholders. Uh, we are open to and experienced both in oil and gas, uh, open to and experienced both in uh, onshore and offshore. Uh, the main project type that we would seek is conventional assets, primary oil, primary gas, um, water flood, uh, potentially EOR. There's a lot of big fields in these regions that are owned by large companies that are later in life, not uh, the uh, uh, main expertise set or the most uh, area that these bigger companies are competitive in. Typically, a lot of projects have been identified but not invested in over the last few years, and uh, we think that's a great opportunity uh, for us. Also, as I mentioned earlier, we see in a number of these uh, strat columns in these areas the potential for these semi-conventional projects where we have low perm conventional plastic traps that might benefit from horizontal development, but it's mainly the conventional production. The advantage overseas leading to these higher returns is really twofold. First of all, it's less competitive than it is in North America. Uh, a typical uh, transaction in North America might have five bidders or even uh, up to 10 bidders on it, uh, whereas in these overseas markets, there just aren't that many competing teams that have the financing capability, the operational expertise, the ESG credentials to uh, gain the uh, support of the sellers and of the host governments. So typically what we end up going against, and they're uh, generally not uh, competitive bid situations, but could be no other uh, companies uh, competing with us, it could be one or two. When you get down to that low level of competition, uh, you can, I think you can see how you can get to higher base rates of return, lower multiples and higher base level uh, rates of return. And then on top of that, there is this operating advantage that we talked about earlier. There's just no question, and we've seen this in our experience, that there are more folds of improvement that are available in terms of production and costs in these overseas assets than in North America. The North American industry is super efficient and super competitive. You can make improvements when you acquire, but not nearly to the degree that you can internationally. So that if you combine those low multiples, high rates of return in the base purchase with a better opportunity for improvement, you can make very high returns on capital when acquiring overseas, and that's what we seek to do. The final point on the slide is, as I mentioned, the board and the management of the team, uh, the, the management team has a great deal of experience in sustainability projects, using those to get access, uh, acceptance in the host jurisdictions, and uh, in a way that benefits the broad stakeholder group, but also our shareholders and we will be using that here. Just to spend uh, a few, uh, maybe one minute on the business philosophy of bond acquisition. Culturally, uh, we will have a flat company, everybody in the company incentivized with equity, a very technically focused company, a very practical company. In terms of the operating structure, decentralized. We typically acquire a very competent national workforce. Usually they've generated a lot of projects that have not been invested in. We put in a little bit of North American content uh, in management and technical resources, and typically we get quite an improvement in the uh, performance of the assets. Capital markets will use low financial leverage. We will control the operating leverage with a degree of hedging and uh, use this set of assets in a growth and income model uh, for the uh, shareholder group. We have a buyback today. We don't have a dividend at our small size, but uh, we do intend to return capital to shareholders uh, over the long term. Uh, just to summarize, we think there's deep value in this market for the reasons I talked about. The low multiples at the beginning, the operating improvement that's available. We'll be stressing Europe, MENA, and then the Americas. The management of the company does have experience in this model, six billion in acquisitions historically, and uh, we have uh, successfully executed each part of the strategy. Thirdly, we're aligned with the shareholders, and we have used this uh, kind of uh, business model uh, effectively in a growth and income uh, capital markets uh, uh, model previously. So uh, thank you for your attention and uh, uh, look forward to the breakout.